it's an Archeo Death interview with Professor Howard Williams and his guest. Okay, welcome Archeo Deathlings to the latest Archeo Death interview with me, Professor Howard Williams, and I have for the first time a pair of guests. We have Dr. Harriet Evans Tang and Dr. Keith Ruta, and together we're going to be exploring animals and people in the Viking Age. Um, we haven't decided on a title of this yet. Well, this is one thing I meant to ask before we began. We'll we'll cook up an exciting title for this interview. But the main point you need to get across is we're going to be discussing all things to do with animality and humanity and their relationships. And we've got two experts here and uh, who have combined their, their skills in a couple of forthcoming uh, collaborative uh, um, publications. And that's what I'd hoped we could we could explore today. So hello, both of you. Would you mind introducing yourself in a more coherent way than I've managed to? <laughs> uh, Keith, go first. <laughs> oh, I was, I was going to give you the privilege. Um, <laughs> So hi, I'm Keith Ruder. I'm senior lecturer at the University of Suffolk uh, here in England. <clears throat> uh, I work predominantly on um, early law in Scandinavia. Um, my specialism is in the Viking Age, uh, but I like to use different methods, different approaches, different disciplines to kind of really play with the way that people are working with each other uh, in this period. I've worked on things like punishment, transgression, um, and yeah, legalism, uh, which is my my current drive. Um, and this, uh, through fun coincidence, has brought me into uh, working closely with my friend Harriet, um, who can now introduce herself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm uh, Harriet Evans-Tang. I'm a postdoctoral research associate at Durham. And I'm working on a project at the moment uh, headed by uh, Professor Karen Millick called Cohabiting with Vikings. And it's about, um, well, mostly domestic animals and how humans and domestic animals are living together and working together, um, particularly in Viking Age Iceland, but also looking at some Scandinavian sites as well. Um, so I'm kind of a literary person by training, but I've slowly been sliding into archaeology. Uh, and that's the best yeah, way to get what, into it. <laughs> the slide, although of, I tripped. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> True, stumbling into archaeology. Um, yeah, and so my general interests are, are animal human relations. Um, I'm particularly interested in, in kind of reading medieval texts, looking at um, uh, animal behavior, you know, real life animal behavior, and seeing kind of how these are depicted and things like that. Um, and then, yeah, how that kind of comes through into the archaeology as well. I'll stop there. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, this is the topic we're going to dive into. But before then, I always ask my guests something. Give us a sense of how you got into this area. You've talked about slipping and sliding and bit, you know, whatever. But my point is, you know, how did each of you get into your your specialism? Because I think it's really good that the audiences get a sense of that backstory. So I took English literature at my undergrad and we had to take a foreign language module. Uh, and I just Old Norse was the one that I fancied. Uh, so at the end of my BA, Old Norse was really the only thing I enjoyed <laughs> about English. I shouldn't say that, but. <laughs> um, and so my my tutor, uh, Professor Matthew Townend, uh, suggested, hey, why don't you do the MA in Medieval Studies here after, after you've done this? And uh, that's kind of where it started. I went into um, this MA in Medieval Studies where I met Keith and, and I took, Steve Ashby's Viking archaeology module uh, and it was amazing you know it was funny because I'd always wanted to be an archaeologist I'd always, like as a kid when we moved house and our garden was a mess my mum kind of gave me a brush and a trowel and was like go and excavate the garden because <laughs> it needed digging up anyway um, but for some reason I'd never gone into it so this was kind of yeah that Viking archaeology module was the the gateway into um, then doing a PhD with Steve and Matt archaeology and literature together and um yeah it's just it made sense in my head to to be doing both so that's how fantastic uh and we've never actually talked about this harriet but um our stories are bizarrely similar um <laughs> i back in canada uh at the university of alberta where i was doing my undergrad uh was doing an english degree as well uh i too had to take a language that was other than english um and i wanted to do something just a bit different um, and Swedish worked really well for my schedule um, and I tumbled down this Scandinavian rabbit hole while at the same time doing a lot of medieval English literature like Beowulf and all of this 
And the two things just kind of continued to coalesce and coalesce and coalesce as I went along. I eventually declared a double major in these things um, and then went to York and did the medieval studies MA, uh, where I too took uh, <laughs> Steve Ashby's uh, archaeology class. And it, it totally... <laughs> I see a, a link here. It's the <laughs> Ashby it, link. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, it totally flipped the switch in me. And I thought, this is this is really, really cool. And I mean, of course... We have Lanso Meadows in Canada, um, this this Viking site in 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 Newfoundland, um, but we we don't have a lot of Viking archaeology otherwise. Uh, so it wasn't really something that I had thought about at all until coming to York. Um, and then actually, it was in an Old Norse reading group uh, that Harriet and I used to attend uh, regularly Thursday nights at the Golden Slipper in York. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, Sounds very uh, Hogwarts to me. <laughs> it was. <laughs> In a lot of ways, it was. Um, we were reading this this text from uh, from Heimskringla, where um, the Yom's Vikings are being executed. And I thought, well, this is really weird. What What's going on with execution in the Viking Age? And this was how I started tumbling down this idea of law, but also then thinking about how it relates to archaeology. When I got to York, I was thinking I was going to do a thesis around language. Um, specifically place names. Um, and I ended up reading this text and just in line with what we were doing in, in Steve's module and, and just more generally the very interdisciplinary Center for Medieval Studies there in York. Um, I ended up doing a, a master's dissertation supervised by Steve on execution and judicial punishment in the Viking Age and looking at how we can read both texts and archaeology to kind of flip back and forth and tell us more about um yeah this this kind of understudied area of uh of of life in the viking age law what are your takes on the potential and challenges of this of of actively advocating an interdisciplinary approach because for decades people have talked about interdisciplinarity you know it gets banded around and i mean that in a good way because if yeah. people aspire to it and talk about it but but you know, I would love to hear your perspectives. You know, before we hear about your research, about what your what's your sort of takeaway key points about the the potentials and challenges of you know crossing disciplines. Um, yeah, I think if if you're if you're working on the Viking Age, um, if you're not working interdisciplinarily, um, you're kind of missing a trick. Our evidence is so fragmentary. Um, our sources are so difficult to grapple with. Um, we we really do need to be kind of using all the tools that we can possibly bring to this material, um, whether that is archaeology or literary uh, literary methods, um, but also things like sociology, um, also things like, yeah, more kind of general anthropological approaches, human animal relations. Um, bringing different tools to the period really helps us paint a, a much richer picture of these human beings that lived in this period. Um, and that's the real promise of interdisciplinarity, I think, is the the fact that we can tell better stories about the past, richer, more sophisticated stories about the people who kind of navigated this very interesting, very complicated, very messy time. Um, the challenge is doing those things well. Um, and this was something Harriet and I were talking about before. Um, I mean, you can't just hold up a a, a a grave and say something about it without actually getting into the context and the methods behind it. When done poorly, holding up archaeology in a in a superficial way doesn't accomplish anything. In the same way that if you're reading a, a an archaeological kind of study of something and they just quote a, a random 14th century saga to reflect on the Viking Age, that doesn't quite do any justice to that as a piece of literature of its time, yes, you can draw those links, but you have to do it carefully. You have to do it kind of with, with some real thought. Um, and I think that's the challenge, is actually respecting each of the disciplines, each of the met methods, each of the, the evidence sets. Um, and you're gonna mess up <laughs> and you have to be okay with messing up um, because yeah, interdisciplinarity is, is also messy. Um, but it's fun and it's worth doing uh, and we should all be supportive of each other messing around with it. <laughs> That's fascinating. Sorry, Keith, your last comment just reminded me of the one of the peer reviews we had back from <clears throat> on one of these chapters where the person was like, um, 
I can't remember which way around it was, whether it was brilliant but messy or messy but brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was gonna I was gonna get that printed on a espresso mug and mail it to you. But <laughs> um, we should make yeah. t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, no, I agree absolutely um, with what Keith, Keith just said. Um, I think as it is harder to do interdisciplinary work, I would say, because, yeah, you've got to be familiar with twice as much material or three times as much material, depending on how many disciplines you're looking at. Yeah. But um, but the rewards are greater, um, as, as as Keith mentioned. And, and for me, it's one of the things I really, really love about doing this kind of research is when I'm reading something or I'm reading a, an, an excavation report or so, and and something just clicks in my brain and I think wait this reminds me of something that, you know from my other data set that I didn't think would be related and I'm not saying that it's the same you know I'm not saying that I've ever found yeah, kind of yeah. a text that you know directly imitates yeah. something I've read in the archaeology but that that kind of that speaks to it and you're like yeah. huh okay absolutely <laughs> mm. um but I will say that one one of the challenges uh, is something that I've been come, thinking a lot about lately is um, a practical one, which is uh, where you publish this kind of research. Yeah. Um, you know, we've been very lucky with these book chapters that our editors were very much on the same page we are um, with the kind of way we work. Um, but kind of finding journals can be a little bit more difficult, I found so far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To totally agree with that. There's a reason that I publish more in books than I do in journals. <clears throat> because the editors tend to be more receptive to more interdisciplinary approaches. Um, there are interdisciplinary journals out there, but um, yeah, when a friend reaches out to you and says, hey, we'd really like you to do something like this. Um, yeah, it's it's much, much nicer to kind of go through that process. That's really fascinating. So I think what my audience has had here is a really, you've captured so many issues about the, the theoretical richness as well as the, the data itself and the challenges of not only doing the work, but then finding the right audience for that work. So I could, we could make a whole video about this, but but I, I'm really glad I asked that up, up front um, because I, th I think that's a really good captured so many issues that I think are really important. Thank you. And my next question is really about the big concepts as driving your latest collaborative research. And perhaps collaboration is another thing we could do a whole video on uh, as a separate challenge. But, you know, but your, your work is collaborative as well as interdisciplinary. And I wanted to ask about the big ideas. And for me, there's uh, the, the perhaps thing that's maybe new to some people, if not perhaps it shouldn't be, but perhaps it is, is, is the idea of a non-human person and the particular idea of a sort of paro, para animality, if that's the right way of saying it, that you draw as the sort of framework for approaching your um, Viking period data sets or at least uh, how you're approaching it. So perhaps you could give, um, give us a sense of what those two terms mean and some of the context of how you're approaching your data. You know, animal personhood, it, it, to me, that it's, I know, the thing that occupies my brain most often <laughs> um, <laughs> is this idea that personhood being a, a thing that's not restricted to humans and, but equally being human doesn't necessarily make you a person or, you know, give you personhood because we know that, well, for example, enslaved persons in the, in the Viking age are not having, you know, perhaps not being conceived of in the same way as a, a freeborn person. And indeed, um, we might discuss later about the laws where there's a bit of a dubious status about who has who has kind of more personhood, dom domestic animals or enslaved people. Um, but for me, it's there's like a there's like a spectrum of personhood, and you know it's fluid and animals. You know, people talk a lot about kind of shape shifting and like humans mm. blurring into the animal. Um, but for me, equally interesting is the animal blurring into the human or the the para animal you know that kind of the these categories and and I and Keith will be able to talk more maybe to to the kind of para animality but for me okay. it's kind of think about human animal we wanted to get away from thinking of them as kind of distinct categories like you know human animal relations but yeah. you know but them actually being connected and kind of fluid and yeah and especially with the old Norse myths and legends we are not just talking about humans of course we're talking about you know Jotun, Aesir, at Verga, you know, there's a whole host of other characters that you can't call human, but, you know, they're not, yeah, you have that kind of spectrum of beings. Um, For me, the thinking about um, kind of non-human personhood um, 
came out of some of the work that I'm doing now toward my monograph, which um, looks to things like uh, indigenous law and indigenous uh, legal studies and thinks about different ways of thinking about law in European history as well, um, especially customary law. <clears throat> and it, one of the things that I kind of encountered while I was reading this was this discussion about uh, non non human personhood within indigenous legal systems. Um, so, for example, in 2017 in New Zealand, um, Maori activists uh, won a really important uh, legal battle to give legal personhood to a river, um, which is viewed as a, a a sacred kind of relation in in their worldview. Um, this is really important in a contemporary setting. I mean, so often indigenous and colonial uh, legal systems conceive of personhood differently. But actually, if we think about it, Western kind of Eurocentric legal systems also recognize non-human persons. Uh, corporations are legally persons yes. in law. Um, and this exactly. is really interesting. So we we can we can kind of play with this idea because clearly there's a there's a there's a tradition of non legal or non-human legal thinking going on there. Um, and so we wanted to kind of extrapolate this into the past a little bit and and play with this idea. But we ran into this issue of of this dichotomy between kind of animal and human as being almost binary opposites of each other. But of course, humans are also animals. And so the we could think of, yeah, non-human persons, but then we're thinking about these things not in relation with each other, but actually in terms of negation from one another, uh, an animal is not a human, a non-human person. Well, that doesn't quite work either. So we kind of thought about different ways of articulating this to try to facilitate a different way of thinking um, and to stop um, conceiving so much of things from an anthropomorphic kind of perspective. Um, and the thing that we ended up kind of coming out with was this idea of para animality. Um, so we have animal, which includes both kind of traditionally animals, but also humans, gods, uh, yeah, Jotnar, the giants in uh, in Icelandic myth, um, <clears throat> dwarves, so on and so forth. Um, and then you have the para animal, which has kind of uh, 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 is a category that's kind of represented by a whole host of other sorts of relationships um, and kind of animal adjacent um, kind of uh, category, which is an extension of animality uh, rather than a, something that is beyond or not animal. Um, and this would then be the thing that includes humans, some of these ambiguous animals that we think about, especially horses is uh, the, the real kind of focus of our work recently. Yes. Yes. Um, but also then, yeah, things like gods. Um, we, we can think about these as beings that are para-animal, kind of an extended category of animality, but with some distinctions that make it uh, something along the spectrum that Harriet was talking about as, as being not no longer just animal, something kind of an extended animal. Well, thank you for explaining this. And this is a broader debate in, in cross disciplines. And it's certainly something that we, you know, if, if it feels unsettling to viewers, it should be because this is about trying to contend with other ways of framing and understanding how society works, its relationship to the natural world, the categories of what is natural, what is human and, and what is cultural, what is not. You know, we, we we use these terms all the time, but using them is a way of introducing more sophisticated terminology, as you do in your articles. And so let's deep dive in then. How do we how do we see this? First of all, in, say, the Norse, Old Norse legends and myths, how do we see aspects of this para animality um, uh, at play in your evidence base? Yeah, so for us, the the best examples uh, to to draw from from the the mythology and the most accessible ones are around some of these very famous horses from Norse myth. Um, Sleipnir being the the kind of quintessential example. Um, here is Sleipnir, Odin's um, eight legged horse. <clears throat> Sleipnir is birthed by Loki in one of the myths that we have in uh, Snorri's Edda. This is a, a 13th century text. 
Um, and uh, he is he is conceived because Loki needs to uh, distract the horse of a giant builder who is supposed to be constructing the walls of Osgar, the the kind of uh, Asgard, the, the the realm of the gods. Um, <clears throat> in exchange for uh, building the walls in a three day time limit. The giant builder is supposed to be given the sun, the moon, and Freya as kind of payment. Um, pretty dicey stuff. Um, and it, because his horse is such a, a, a potent kind of companion, um, he is actually really approaching um, kind of completing this task. And so the gods convene with Loki and say, look, you, you kind of brought this guy to us. You kind of framed this, this agreement. Um, we don't want to give away the sun, the moon, and Freya. Um, you need to do something here. Um, and so this is a case where a a more than human being or a para animal being, Loki, um, blurs into the animal. Loki changes into the form of a mare, and uh, using his marish wiles, uh, lures uh, the stallion of the giant builder named Svavafari uh, away, uh, so that the giant cannot complete his task. Um, and through this uh, distraction, um, <laughs> we have Sleipnir conceived um, and eventually given to Odin. But Sleipnir is this really interesting para-animal in and of himself because he is deeply enmeshed in the relationships between the gods. Um, he is very, very useful in their society. He allows them to kind of move from one realm to another. We have this happening in some of the Eddic poems. Um, and he is uh, this this kind of um, kind of constant companion of, of Odin. Um, and when we look in the poetic corpus of Old Norse poetry, we see him most associated with Odin, not his mother, Loki. Um, so we can see a a horse that is clearly more than just a horse, uh, not only physically, it has eight legs, um, but also in terms of the way that it relates to a society around it. Um, and, and this was a real kind of starting point for us thinking about actually how do these relationships kind of co-constitute each other? How How is Svelofari invited, or Svelofari, Sleipnir invited into uh, Aesir society? And how are the Aesir kind of kind of relating with um, this this uncanny horse or this para animal horse? Do you want to go further with the case of Grani? Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I just reminded me that you know way back when uh, <clears throat> when I was a student, I did a paper on um, on Sleipnir, and I called it. Uh, I kept referring to him as Sleipnir Lokason because I was like, oh, I'm going to emphasize that his relationship to Loki. But actually, I should have called it Sleipnir Odin's Fostry, you know, yeah. <laughs> Odin's foster son. Um, but no, so yeah, so the second the second example that we talk about in in our chapters is um, Grani, uh, Sigurd's horse yeah. in um, in Volsunga Saga, I suppose, but also the the Sigurd poems in the the Poetic Edda. Um, so here we have this horse who. Um, Actually, it doesn't say in the poetry, but in Volsunga Saga, kind of is sort of given to Sigurd by Odin. You know, he, Odin takes Sigurd down to a, a fjord, I think, and there's all these horses in the river, and he says, "Oh, pick the pick this horse." Um, and so uh, Sigurd picks Grani, and he's just the constant companion of of Sigurd. In in the Eddic poetry, Sigurd is very very rarely mentioned once he has acquired granny it's like he's very rarely mentioned without him you know it's, it's always riding on riding on the horse the the horse mounted king you know the the burden of granny is a um a kenning for the gold that Sigurd gets from Falfnir. Yes. like he, he can't acquire that gold unless he puts it on granny and rides away with it and um sorry i wrote my my ma dissertation <laughs> partly on on Sigurd and granny um <clears throat> but here we have this animal who is yeah very much entangled with the hero it's very much a part of how the hero is being sigurd is being represented and perceived and also the um moments in the eddic poetry after sigurd's death where grani is depicted as as grieving the the dead his dead human partner 
um you know so like i think it's good good the second lament of gudrun where it's described she's kind of standing there and the horse granny comes over and he droops his head in the grass and he kind of um I can't say I can't remember whether it says grieving or weeping. It's you know it's like the horse knows that the the prince is dead, you know, um, and so this is very, uh, yeah, just a kind of he's he's acting like a kind of social being, a social I say social being, and uh, uh, you know in these kind of human social relationships um, in Sigurd's a way that kind of slays. Like, yeah. Gudrun, they 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 mourn together. They. Yeah. It's just the two of them in this moment of mourning for Sigurd. Um, and so in a way, there's almost this supporting going on as well. Sorry, I just wanted to jump in and, no, that, and that add, is a great add point. that really important <laughs> kind of, yeah, relation, relational element. Yeah. That's, no, that's, 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 sorry, I was just going to one more thing. I was no, of relating to the relationship between, yeah, Sigurd, Gudrun and, and Granny. There's a moment at the end of and I can't remember the poem, <laughs> but it's right at the end of kind of Gudrun's kind of story where she talks about how she wishes that, you know, when she closes her eyes, she she can see Sigurd riding towards her on Grani, like from the dead kind of thing. And this um, and actually riding horses from the grave to your loved ones crops up in, in one of the other uh, Eddic po poems as well. But the yeah, so poems. just, yeah. The how, um, so, yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, that was just the final point about that relationship, and that even in death, Sigurd and Granny are, are intertwined and pulled back in, in Gudrun's mind, anyway. Now, I'd like to keep this focus on horses, but do you want to say anything about this not being just horses before we go on to the legal stuff? Because, I mean, I think when we think of the Norse myths and legends, it, horses figure mostly, but, you know, there are allusions to other beasts that may have had similar roles. I don't know. We don't know enough or we can talk about them in those terms. <clears throat> um, well, I mean, I was thinking about this just before just before we came on and I was thinking how. um in the in the myths and legends i i would say the the kind of social roles the horses have is quite distinct i think okay. I get my um but but the, there's definitely uh a larger kind of spectrum of kind of para animal or kind of a blurring between the para animal and the animal and and everything you know there are characters that you yeah. never know one minute there are one minute they're a, a giant the next minute they're a dragon the next minute someone's a fish you know it's like they just they seem to have a very f loose and easy um attitude to categorization um which is frustrating when you're trying to figure out yeah what someone is at a specific point but then you're like well maybe that's not the point maybe the point is they can be all of these things at, at once um but uh, but i also before i pass over to keith i wanted to um say that it's not just kind of in myth and legend that we get this kind of seeping into different categories um one of the things that i've done recently is is looking at the way animals are used in descriptions of people in other texts and it's just constant constantly people are being compared to animals or yeah. being referred to as animals and and it's just and also ship you know objects are being yes. described like you know ships houses even being you know described in terms of being a horse or a bear or a, and it's just that kind of yeah constant blurring but anyway i pass on to keep <laughs> no yeah i i think there's there's something special going on with horses for sure <clears throat> some of the other animals that do show up in the myths and legends are things like eagles and fish and yes. at one point an otter um <clears throat> there's there's a, a few pigs and some some deer of various kinds um but none of them seem to have the same kind of uh, relational potential that horses do. And this is something maybe we can come back to as we go along, uh, especially as we start thinking about the archaeology and everything else. Um, but um, this this could potentially be, and one of the things that we've kind of thought about a little bit, is the fact that the horse is a domestic animal and these other animals are uh, either non-domesticatable or 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 yeah wild um and and so their potential for forming kind of pro-social relationships uh is is somewhat diminished in that and this this may be one of the reasons why there is such uh, an emphasis on horses 
but as we found out in kind of looking at a whole bunch of different other evidence sets, um, it's not just horses. Other domestic animals okay. are invited into those sorts of relationships as well, um, just not in the myths and legends, interestingly. Well, let's stick, to, uh, though it's a, you know, I think it's important people know there's other categories going on, other yeah. things going on. Let's stick with horses then and, and dive into some of those other e evidence sets and, and look at the legal material you've been looking at in one of your forthcoming papers. Would you be willing to sort of tell us about the legal, you know, how this relates? Sorry, to, I know it's myths and legends do relate to people's real world, but let's get, you know, in popular terms, let's get into the real world of the, the North society. How did, how, did, how did this affect legal tax then? How do we see this? Yeah, so I mean, the, the legal texts are a whole other kind of text, obviously. Um, we're no longer dealing with something that is literary, um, but law and storytelling and interpretation are kind of like very sophisticatedly uh, wrapped up in each other um, in, in any legal context, um, whether that's contemporary or Viking Age or, or what have you. Um, so when we come to the legal text, it requires uh, a a careful approach, just like any other. Um, but the the legal texts are really interesting because they reveal to us um, the the ways in which people thought about animals uh, in part of kind of human dispute resolution and and kind of regulating society um, and and how yeah just how people are getting on with each other um, and. That's really interesting because when we think about the Viking Age, we can think about the whole kind of the raiding, the raiding, and all of this kind of stuff. But actually, yes. I mean, the the bulk of the Viking Age kind of social activity is taking place in kind of subsistence farming sorts of settings. Um, <clears throat> and and we we shouldn't lose sight of this because especially when we're thinking about animals and para animality and human animal relationships, um, uh, all of that is happening on a farm effectively um, with, with very few exceptions. Um, and so looking to the legal text and thinking about how people are regulating themselves and animals, um, this is hugely important. Uh, in order to have farmers living in close proximity to each other, you're gonna need to know what to do if your horse gets out or if you find somebody's pig in your field. Um, you, you need to have recourse to, to law in, in these cases. Um, and so when we started looking at the, the legal texts, we kind of discovered that actually a, a lot of that kind of potential for animals to be invited into human relationships is showing up in the legal texts themselves. Animals are ascribed with a sort of legal agency, um, not to be compared with like full free men, um, but there are really interesting cases where <clears throat> animals are being held responsible for their actions, um, not the owner of those animals. So when we were looking at things like the continental Scandinavian laws, um, we can see places where animals are um, being described in the same way uh, that slaves are um, in terms of being born um, kind of at home as opposed to elsewhere. Um, and this this relates to a different kind of category of ownership and therefore a different amount of responsibility and rights um, that are offered in, in that kind of, or offered is a bad term, recognized um, in those cases. Um, but then we, we also have really interesting things where if an animal is responsible for causing certain damages, it is to be passed over to the the landowner or the the freeman who is kind of bringing the case and that freeman decides what should be done with that animal um, in the same way that a slave would be if a slave is responsible for damages that slave is supposed to be passed over for kind of a a a, a degree of what at the time was considered justice um, and we want to be really careful here and say that you know slavery is awful, people suffered horribly under it in the Viking Age and at various other times in human history. Animals <clears throat> also were mistreated in the past in a whole variety of different ways. Um, these are uncomfortable topics to kind of pick up, but <clears throat> well worth doing, well worth thinking about and trying to understand the way that different categories of person, um, again, whether that is para-animal or animal, um, 
the ways that different categories of person are are treated in this time. Um, yeah, Harriet, do you want to take the laws further? Um, <clears throat> just to uh, yeah, I mean, just to agree with you, really. <laughs> I mean, in in the Icelandic uh, Graugaus, which is the the medieval Icelandic uh, law book or collection of laws, I should say. Um, we again, yeah, we have this sense of of animals having legal agency. They have legal immunity. They have a, a status that can be withdrawn from them if they commit certain crimes. You know, if a if a bull kills somebody, they can lose their immunity and therefore be killed, just like an outlaw, a human outlaw can. Um, and particularly with reference to horses, horses are, I think, the only one of the only animals that um, have kind of different kind of st statuses in, in Graugau. So there's a bridle tamed horse and a non bridle tamed horse have two different legal, you know, two different legal categories, two different um, kind of ways of associating with them. Um, but I just also wanted to highlight the thing Keith said um, about being born at home. It's really interesting in, in Icelandic uh, Graugaus, that doesn't come up at all. Like that's not a phrase that's used about animals at all, which is kind of interesting. And in this, but in the Scandinavian laws, it's everywhere. You know, this. You know, if you're settling ownership disputes, like, oh well, you know, can you prove this animal is homeborn? You know, <laughs> um, which I hadn't really thought about before. Right now, it's being, um, uh, yeah, this, this again, a different kind of legal category uh, that we've got going on. Um. No, the Icelandic laws are really interesting to think about in this case, because in terms of culpability, animals are held up to a level that is perhaps unexpected in terms of their culpability and in some cases their legal protection. Um, in terms of culpability, a, uh, some animals are actually given um, more responsibility for their actions than um, minors. Um, not the people who dig in the dirt, no, but no, no. Young, young people. Younger people. Um, <laughs> Uh, they're they're giving more responsibility than than minors and people who are considered criminally or or legally um, insane. Uh, so they're they're offered a, a a different legal status than a a wide variety of free people as well. So it's not just a a, a straight correlation of animals and slaves. There's actually some very interesting kind of other categories that be, are being drawn into comparison. Uh, in in the Icelandic legal material. Fascinating, fascinating. So you've already alluded to other categories of written evidence that we could draw upon, but let's dive into the archaeology now, if we may. And how does this help us understand, or how do we draw upon the archaeological evidence in this discussion? <laughs> um, it, yeah. So the the archaeology is fascinating. Um, there's there's so many different ways that. Um, animals have, have been discussed in, in archaeology. But the, the predominant one, uh, the, the predominant way of speaking about especially horses in this period <clears throat> is that they're, they're a category of grave good. Um, yes. they're, they're included in a burial assemblage um, as, as part of kind of funerary rites as, as another thing to serve the person in the grave. Um, and, and I mean, there's there's loads of reasons to think that way. Um, the thing that we wanted to do was actually kind of do a little bit of a thought experiment of well, that's well discussed. What happens if we look at it in a different way? Um, and when we were thinking about this this para animality that we were kind of witnessing in these other evidence sets, we really kind of wanted to think about okay, well, like let's let's look at it in the mortuary evidence. Let's look at it in the archaeology, and let's let's think about what other relationships might be alluded to in those funerary rites. And so we were thinking about a, a whole variety of different burials, but we, we kind of started with, um, with, with atypical burials, um, things that somewhat stand apart from uh, the, the, the very loosely categorized normative funerary practices of the Viking Age, which are super diverse and, and really hard to categorize anyway. Um, but there are there are some patterns that emerge and there are some graves that are really broadly discussed and kind of loosely accepted to be s somewhat different from what else is going on, even within the, the same cemeteries that they're showing up within. Um, so we, we started thinking about some of these and we noticed that while there are a, a large category of graves um, that uh, 
horses in particular are, are set in the foot of the grave, um, in the grave cut itself, with some distance between the the, the human in the grave um, and various kind of items and things strewn about, whatever um, <clears throat> intentionally placed. I should say I, I should I should be less less candid about that. Intentionally placed by by a community of mourners um, in in this kind of funerary process. Um, we did notice that there's there's a few graves that really stood out in the continental Scandinavian um, kind of burial corpus, where the horse is actually brought in much closer, uh, in many cases, direct contact with the human in the grave cut. Yes. Um, and these stood out as particularly interesting to us, especially if we're thinking about blurring of boundaries and kind of disassembling dichotomies and all of this. Um, these were places where the the space within the grave was diminished and the the kind of enmeshment or the the actual layering of of human and horse was happening in a physical way. And that was kind of interesting to think about. So we looked at a few of these and we we established a small corpus where there there is something interesting going on in some of these graves and it turns out that there are also graves um, that are a little different than some of the others that are around them um, well, be and... specific here please what what, <laughs> what makes these different for people who don't know yeah this stuff, sure you know? uh, i mean i can i can hold up a a, a nice picture that was yes. <laughs> uh we were allowed to use for our our article oh um so this is a this is a, a reconstruction of a grave from Denmark um, by an artist called Miroslav Kuzma um, <clears throat> and and Lezik Gardewa, who is one of the editors of the uh, of the book. Um, and you can see here that this is this is a little different <laughs> than yes. than many Viking Age burials. We have we have a woman. Um, in the in the grave, um, she kind of seems to be the human at the center of the thing, um, and she's directly overlain by a by a horse. Um, there's lots of other weird stuff going on in the grave. Yeah. There's um, there's a very famous uh, copper tipped um, stick uh, stick like object, um, staff like object. It's been interpreted as, um, which has been used to kind of argue that this is probably some sort of magical practitioner. Um, of the Viking Age. Um, there's also a bisected dog in the foot of the grave cut. Um, there's this very interesting stone that's kind of placed in the grave as well. Um, some various other uh, accoutrements, including uh, some knives, a box, a bucket. Um, but this is this is obviously a, a, quite an atypical grave in a whole bunch of ways. Um, there's a lot of things going on in it that are just a little different than the things that are also going on even in the same burial ground um, and in the same kind of local context. Um, so strange things happening here. Um, why is the horse directly overlaying this person? Um, not only is the horse not at the foot of the grave, but actually it's sandwiching this 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 person. Um, and so we we started thinking more broadly about what's going on in graves like this. Um, and in alignment with the the texts that we were reading, um, we started thinking about how um, animals, not just horses, but horses specifically, are implicated in funerary rituals as well, as participants in those funerary rituals. You need animals to construct many graves, especially the big monumental ones that people yeah. are used to thinking about. Um, you you have um, ho horses in some of the, the, the ship burials, for example. Um, some of them are bridled and some of them are not. So some of these are directly implicated in the rituals that go into the construction of the grave. Um, and some of them seem to be potentially sacrificed. Uh, we can we can certainly talk about this. Um, but it started us thinking about horses as potentially having some agency in these rituals as well. And that's really the kind of the focus of our, our second book chapter. Um, but the interesting thing with this book chapter was um, it got our radars up thinking about the 
different ways that horses can appear in graves. And that's really what brought us to the Icelandic burial car- corpus. Okay, because horses where, are big there. I mean, lots of horses. Where really <laughs> weird things go on with horses in yeah. Icelandic archaeology. Um, and I think maybe I'll just pass it over to Harriet. And um, do, do you want to do anything more with the continental stuff or do you want to go to the um, Icelandic stuff? Uh, I do have something to say about the continental stuff, but I can mm. I can hold it for because I think it'll come up in a in a bit okay <laughs> so i can hold it um so i mean icelandic burial corpus is um it's frustrating because a lot of icelandic archaeology early icelandic archaeology and particularly early icelandic burial archaeology was um quite poorly recorded so uh, as far as i understand it you know people they were digging up the ground yeah. to, to lay roads and they would find a, a burial and they would say they'd ring up the archaeologist in, in Reykjavik and say oh I found this burial and um, come and pick it up you know but they would just sort of move it to the side you know just move up everything all the bones or whatever they could see and just shove it to the side and carry on building the road um, which obviously doesn't make for a very uh, satisfying um, object of study when you, you can't see how these the the people and the animals um the people and the horses were were laid out um but yeah but the burials that we that we do have i mean it's it's horses are there a lot as as uh you know if people know anything about icelandic fight uh pre-christian burials they tend to know that there's usually a horse um dogs occasionally but not nearly so much um and we also find a variation you know we find obviously the kind of more standard human and horse usually kind of at the bottom um of the of the grave but we also find it seems burials where horses were buried or could have been buried on their own um which to us was really fascinating because um and and it may be you know that preservation and excavation conditions mean that a a body was missed or maybe a you know a body was was removed at some point but um there are quite a few of them though yeah which is interesting um and and these are in some cases furnished burials as well. Yeah. Not not just a horse in a grave, but a horse with stuff in a grave. With grave goods. <laughs> yeah, as I like to think about them. You know, we have things where horses have been decapitated in this grave. Um and or kind of several horses have been kind of piled in and mixed up and, you know, cut in half and maybe and and things like this. Um so yeah, there's a kind of weird but it's but it's interesting that they're very different um from the Scandinavian graves, at least um from what I can remember, you know, that in in Scandinavia we have a wide range of of, of burials with horses. Of course, we have equestrian burials in, in Vikings Denmark and other sorts of things and, and always kind of in kind of high status graves. Whereas in Iceland, um the graves are kind of less rich, mm. but the one thing that they yeah, that they seem to have a, mostly in common is this kind of horse um yeah um the the decapitation thing is interesting especially if we start thinking about it in alignment with graves that have been discussed as um uh related to things like execution um decapitation is is one of the ways that people are executed um in in the viking age um and it's interesting to look at alongside uh the the other animals that have been discussed as being sacrificed. Um, an Icelandic um, archaeologist, uh, Runa Leifsson, um, did a, a really comprehensive look at um, at animal skeletons um, and finds that the predominant way that animals, um, large animals like um, cattle and, and horses, are, are killed in association with uh, ritual practice um, are uh, are, are by pole axing. Um, yeah. so they're, they're kind of really badly mistreated ab- about the head. Um, but they're not decapitated in the corpus of horses. Um, there's actually quite a, quite a number that are decapitated either perimortem, uh, so at, at the moment of death, um, or kind of afterwards postmortem. Um, and and this stood out as really interesting because if we're thinking about <clears throat> horses being in alignment with different categories of persons, um, why not think about horses as also being capable of being punished 
<clears throat> and and this was one of the things that we we ended up discussing in in this book chapter um was the the idea of one of these very famous horses from the Icelandic sagas as potentially being well executed uh as part of a a human feud uh that's that's happening in in eastern Iceland um and and so it gave us another way to read between these different pieces of evidence and to think differently um, mm. uh, about what what might be going on with this really strange uh, group of, of burials. But that bisecting of animals and kind of mixing up of skeletons um, does happen in, in other contexts um, and does seem to be associated with funerary rituals. Again, that um, that image of the the woman's grave from Denmark uh, has a bisected dog in the foot of the grave where the dog has been cut in half and then kind of roughly reassembled in in the grave cut. Um, and it seems like this is happening with horses in a few other graves as well, especially ship burials. Um, and uh, through kind of just conversation uh, about a year ago, I was chatting with Leslie Abrams and she was uh, bringing up, and we didn't get a chance to include it here, she was bringing up this really interesting idea that um, in some of the early medieval um, continental sources, there's discussion of uh, an agreement that's struck between a, a Christian and uh, non-Christian group. And to seal the deal, um, what they do is the, this, this kind of non-Christian group cuts an animal in half, pulls it apart, and the people who form this agreement walk in between the two pieces. So it becomes like the two pieces of a charter or something. Yes. Um, yes. So there, there's potentially something really interesting going on with the bisecting of animals and the kind of ratification of agreements or or some sort of kind of formal legal ritual um and and potentially this has some bearing on what's going on archaeologically as well um really really interesting stuff um <laughs> going on with the bisecting of animals but uh we didn't get into it too much in in our stuff we just kind of raised it as this is something weird and and encourages us to think about these things differently because we don't have good explanations for some of these phenomena and so right. all the better for us to try to think differently about them I try and put forward some different interpretations. <laughs> I mean, I'm just trying to think of analogies for people who perhaps would scoff at this and think, oh, well, you know, it's just an animal. It's being treated in a funeral and so on. I mean, the analogy I would use it and tell me if you think this is uh, misleading or not, is if there was a social expectation that people value their cars and the cars also have to go into the graves today, that you may not actually think that you, most of the audience may not think much of the car or like that car. But if there's an expectation to do it, suddenly you've got to dig a massively bigger grave cut. So you've got if you're burning it on a pyre, the pyre's got to be bigger so the Nissan Micra can be shift up it. So regardless of what you think of that particular car, the social expectation and the inclusion and it means that the funeral, it does have agency because that car's presence is affecting where you put everything else on that pyre or in that grave. And then all the other stories that you're telling in relation between the person and the car and other people who didn't have a car and why that person's car never got on the, in the grave and so on, or whether you, and, and she, so maybe that analogy has gone wild now, but my no, point no, is. I think it's, I think it's great. I think it's really, really great. And it can be taken even further because yeah, maybe not everybody cares too, too much about their Nissan Micra, but the guy who has assembled his car lovingly by hand yes, over was... the years and has invested so much of himself into it, and that, that vehicle has been part of every major kind of life event that they, I mean, I still think very fondly about my very first car, which was a 1980 Toyota Corolla with a wine red interior. Um, I mean, that that car meant so much to me at that point in time. And and there's there's no reason to think about it as not having been an important part of the relationships that I was involved with at that point in time. And so thinking about these vehicles um, in a contemporary sort of context as being a place where, yeah, relationships can be made. That's interesting. And that gets into the whole object oriented ontologies and all of this. Um, yes. and, and that's definitely a, a, a kind of a, a, an area to think about. But I think the thing that makes the horse even more interesting is that we're not just dealing with an inanimate object anymore. No. We're dealing with a living thing with a certain amount of autonomy. 
yes. if not agency. And the thing that we're arguing for is that there is indeed agency and autonomy that we can read at all levels of the evidence, um, whether that is, yeah, legal personhood or whether that is a really interesting kind of ambiguity in the literary sources or whether that is some of these really interesting things that are going on archaeologically, um, we can really see that ambiguity very, very clearly. I'm really interested in the implications of this with funerals before we look more broadly, because, I mean, presumably we're thinking of scenarios where the behaviour of the animal to a death of its owner slash, you know, someone in its its farm slash kin group, whatever we, you know, the animal's relationship with the personal persons, you know, its its behaviour is, is going to be A, unpredictable, B, you know, animals, you're trying to herd and, and, and people to a funeral, let alone herd <laughs> animals to these events. The way in which you're killing it, um, where you're killing it, what you do with the bits of it, all of this is really complex and sensorial in many different ways. You know, it's it's these funerals always depicted, much as I like Cosmo's image, it's another clean dry funeral scene um, we have to think these would have been absolutely blood strewn events surely i mean at least at moments of them not the whole thing you know weather conditions you know how far people have had to travel to get there you know, i'm just trying to think about you know a society that's reading the animal and the animals an agent within that and it's a funeral isn't an, a, a moment it's it's a process isn't it mm, so yeah. i think there's so many things my brain's buzzing about thinking about what you're saying here it's fascinating do you want to talk about the racing horses thing you do uh, it <laughs> <laughs> i can yeah well that was actually something i wanted to say first but then i can talk about the the racing horses yeah yeah thing. No. um so i this just put me in mind of so there's been a burial a burial um excavated at, at Fregerslev in, in Denmark. And um, yeah. this was a burial where it looked empty. Um, I think. And then so they brought in, they did loads of analysis because they were looking at the, the biolipid markers in the soil to see um, what animal feces were evident, see if they could map out, you know, who was in this burial. And um, there was a man or a, or a human, I should say, and a, and a horse. But what was um, one of the most, well, two things that, that I wanted to bring up. And one was that they also found evidence for a kind of nose bag full of oats um, that had been on the horse when it had been killed. So I was just thinking about that, how like, if you're trying to encourage a horse to kind of go somewhere and keep them calm, you know, giving them something to eat, um, part might be part of that process. Um, as opposed to kind of food for the afterlife or something like that. Yes, um, yes. Um, but also that when, one of the things that I had never really thought about in all our, in all my years of, of thinking about horses and burials, I'd never really thought about what happens when you kill a horse in situ, you know, horse feces everywhere. <laughs> and it just kind of, when you were talking about that kind of clean burial, that was mm. another thing that struck me was, you know, today we think of, of burial being a very dignified event and you, yes. you, 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 you know, the, the, the funeral home will clean you up and, and, you know present you well and and actually here we've got as you say kind of blood everywhere from from animal sacrifices feces everywhere you know it's just a very different picture of especially of, um, if you're bisecting uh, animals yeah. i mean <laughs> <laughs> um and actually kind of related to that um i was thinking and i don't have the picture here um but i can i can send it to you to kind of put up on the screen um it's another burial reconstruction from the same um the same artist as the the one Keith showed, and it's of a burial at uh, Louvre. Louvre. I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, and it's a. We talk about it in our in our book uh, chapter about um, horses and, and ritual action. Um, okay. Uh, and it's a woman who's lying there, looking very calm and serene. And there's an axe next to her, and then there's a horse kind of looping round and the horse's leg is sort of slightly over her leg. So it's another one of those kind of entangled burials. Um, but when I was talking to, to Lejek Gardea, who who sent me this image for something else, he said, actually, the horse's head was probably, the horse's head was missing in this image, uh, in this burial. But because they've been accused of kind of high gore images in their, in their reconstructions, yeah. they've actually, in the reconstructed image, they've kept the head's horse intact um and so it, going off on a bit of a tangent but it was just when we were thinking about kind of the gore of these burials yes i found that really 
interesting. I didn't quite know what to think of it because I thought, well, I I want everything to be kind of you know look authentic. But but I guess if you're using these kind of public displays and you you, uh, you may not want to I don't know discuss people too much. But um, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, th I think it speaks. To, I mean, maybe other listeners won't know my personal sort of discussions of issues to do with death ritual in the Viking Age. But you know, one of the things I think is one of those really helpful ideas but misleading ideas is the idea of theatre and I love the idea um, and it's really helpful to think about these visual spectacles but also it presumes that everyone's got a script and knows what they're supposed to be doing mm. and a lot of the actors in this performance you know with be they children enslaved people you know um, people just looking on going what the heck's going on down there and the animals and the other materials that we talk about you know I think can can easily calling them props doesn't help necessarily that's my I don't know if you want to respond to that or you think that's too too unfair on me of me but I, I think that this this is this is a both a brilliant idea but also perhaps a leads people into to choreographed a, or to formalize the sense of what we might be finding evidence for in the archaeological record I don't know no, I, I think I, I think flagging up that these aren't props is is really important. Um, I, I mean, a prop doesn't have a ton of agency. Uh, it, no. We we could think about it as having some through things like object oriented ontologies, but most people aren't thinking of a prop as as something that has any agency. No. Um, it's a tool for something else. Yes. Um, and I think one of our main points is these these animals, especially horses are far more than props in in funerary rituals in in many cases they are willing or unwilling yeah. they are participants yeah. um and and they are they are being kind of manipulated uh in various ways sometimes um but they are still leave, living breathing things um and and we shouldn't be thinking about them as as props um in fact yeah thinking about them as props really r reduces our ability to kind of think about how they fit into those farming agrarian kind of societies um anytime that you're sacrificing an animal um you are you are sacrificing um that's that's another really important point is i mean th these are these are valuable members of households in many cases um, that facilitate either income, transportation, um, work, <laughs> uh, tra like they, they, they have a whole, a whole kind of host of roles to play in Viking Age farmsteads. And, and we can't lose sight of the fact that, yeah, they, these, these aren't just props. They, they are important parts of human communities. Yeah. Um, but I think you're also right in that, um, yeah, a, a funeral is something that is emotional. Um, it, it's it's not something that's clean, e even in a contemporary setting, oh. as cleaned up as they might be. I mean, there is always that element of 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 human emotion and and life that kind of comes out. Um, at uh, at a friend of mine's funeral, um, when uh, they they had a, a bagpiper come in um near the end of the the ceremony and um it was a very very small church and a very very loud bagpiper actually and, yes that that's not mm. <laughs> and and there was this moment of like genuine shock surprise and then laughter in in yeah. the whole space because nobody had thought about the fact that that bagpiper even though really quite scripted would have a different sort of effect yes. inside this small space. Yeah. Um, and and my friend would have loved this. He would have gotten a total yeah. kick out of the fact that everybody burst into laughter when they were totally surprised by this very loud bagpiper. And it made the whole thing that much more beautiful and so much more interesting. But yeah, I mean, thinking about these things as theatrical, I think does do a disservice to the 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 persons that are um that are that are part of those rituals um there's there's more at play there and we can talk about them in different ways that i think bring forward that humanity a little bit more this is fascinating um so 
I think we've already answered this question about what you think the broader implications are for the study of the Viking world. Uh, but do you, is there anything more broadly you think this discussion, you know, um, where it takes us, you know, beyond graves, beyond uh, legal texts and the, the myths and legends? Is there any broader connectivity that we we've perhaps missed so far or implications of your ongoing work? Um, well, I think this this is going to sound weird considering we've just been talking about you know things being quite brutal and and gory and things. But I think um, part of the things that I try and do in my research, anyway, with with animals, is to kind of get past this I, this idea of the Viking Age being just brutal and and messy, and there actually being these moments of of care and attention and it, with animals and I suppose with other people, but mostly with the animals in my case. Um, and I guess, so I guess I, I, one of the things I always have in my head is is about challenging uh, preconceptions of the Viking Age and how that's used in our current societies. But also I think that thinking deeply about, thinking critically about the past enables us to think more critically about um, things that, you know, our current, our current societies. And only you know, particularly for me, it, working on animals, human relations in the Viking Age has, is really kind of changed or is starting to change the way I'm I'm thinking about animal human relations today you know in my life um and so for me that was that was quite an important moment um I don't know yeah no uh, I I think this is something that Harriet and I kind of see really eye to eye on um is is the idea of cons confronting some of that baggage that everybody kind of brings to the Viking Age um turns out a lot of that is really unhelpful um, we do need to kind of think about the period in, in different ways. We do need to confront some of those assumptions about um, what what the period looks like. Um, for me, I mean, so much of my work kind of focuses on law and legalism and the way that people kind of try to get on with each other in the period, um, which involves a lot of really interesting, really sophisticated problem solving um, and and relating with each other to get through kind of life's messiness. Um, and by thinking about the Viking Age as a place where non-humans or kind of para-animals uh, and animals themselves are invited into human society, um, I think that means a lot for us looking forward. I think it means a lot for us kind of to, to, to rethink the relationships that we draw in contemporary society as well. Um, and I think the more that we dig into, pardon the pun, um, the the humanity of the past and the the compassion in the past and the 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 kind of relationality of the past, without eschewing the the fact that lots of it is 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 yucky and and not very nice and and full of of people treating each other badly. Um, I, I think the more we can deal with that yuckiness and unpleasantness in contemporary society and try to look for different ways forward. Um, yeah, inviting non-human persons um, into relationality in, in a contemporary setting, I think is definitely something we want to be thinking about in a in a vastly warming world um, and, and other things besides. And it's a it's a topic I've been fascinated with with animal human relationships in 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 twentieth twenty first century uh, work and the, you know uh, mortuary rituals and so on and it's a it's a fascinating uh, area that we look back to the past there's so many axes of of misunderstanding that we have to you know, want to over brutalize or sanitize or you know there's so many things we're trying to not do with the Viking Age and I think we're trying to be responsible not to do but equally we do have really important stories to tell that yeah. reflect on our contemporary or recent experiences as, as as human societies with these complex relationships with non-human persons or, or um, if I've slipped back into the wrong terminology forgive me but you know yeah <laughs> it's easy to do. I mean, we're conditioned to kind of think about it that way. And I mean, that's why that's why this kind of thinking is best suited for this kind of writing. I mean, yeah. it, it gives you a formal kind of framework in, that you can lay out and really carefully m modulate your your terminology. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's totally normal for us to think about non-human persons because that's that's the way we think. Um, 
but maybe we can think a little differently if we if we keep thinking in these sorts of veins. I don't know. So two quick questions to wrap up, please. Uh, firstly, uh, where is your research going in the future? Have you plans to collaborate together or have you got, are you going off on separate tra trajectories or you're not sure? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I haven't said this to Keith yet, but <laughs> I have a very good idea that I think we should work on, but um, <laughs> but it's not formed yet. But um, no, my next project is is about bears. Uh, and bear human relationships, um, which actually was partly inspired by your your article on uh, citations in stone uh, about hogbacks. Um, so, so yeah, so I, I've got I've got a bit of funding to to do a project on. It's a very ambitious project. Uh, basically, I'm going to be looking at um, bear re um, references to bears in uh, textual sources, so relating to kind of medi Viking Age and medieval uh, Scandinavia and Iceland, looking at textual sources, um, laws burial uh you know bear skins and burials bear claws um also st stonework sculpture yes. uh but also place names as well and just um yeah kind of and and indigenous uh so kind of salmi um ethnography as well like looking at their stories and then thinking about cross-cultural contact between north and salmi um yeah don't know how i'm going to do all this in in nine months but that's in the, a month oh that's well the next the, well, nine let months, me know if months, I, so. I i've got various ideas i'm happy to share because i haven't finished them up but there's i, I, I love my hogbacks and uh yeah. and uh yeah there, there's some really interesting things about those but yes wonderful i'm looking forward to that whenever you get to do it it's fantastic <laughs> yeah um, I'm I'm really interested in hearing your idea. Um, as as we've talked about, um, yeah, more collaborations probably in the future. Um, Harriet's an awesome person to to write with. She's she's the best. Um, <laughs> but uh, in in the kind of short term, um, I'm continuing to work on customary law in the Viking Age, um, thinking about um, what it looks like when people are are kind of practicing law as a community on the ground um, in in the landscape. Um, so uh, myself and, and two collaborators, uh, Christine Eckholst at Uppsala and Alex Sandmark in uh, yes. University of Highlands and Islands um, are, are starting a uh, really exciting project thinking about um, landscape uh, aspects to customary law in the Viking Age and and how it kind of progresses into the medieval period and and potentially later. Um, this is uh, funded by Berit Valin Berry's Stiftelse in Sweden, um, and so we're we're going to be uh, beginning that work uh, hopefully very soon. Um, all the usual kind of academic bureaucracy in the meantime, um, and then my my real kind of focus is finishing up my my monograph, uh, which is also on um, law and life in the Viking Age. Um, so continuing to work there, um, and again bringing a lot of these indigenous legal studies approaches to our material and trying to see how we can think differently about it. Um, again, working between archaeology and runology and textual analysis and, and all of these other things, um, which I like to play with. Um, but yeah, uh, Harriet, let's talk about <laughs> bears and other ideas. Yeah. <laughs> well, my final point was where can folks find out more about your work, but um, we'll put links in the descriptions, but is there, you've already flagged up the various projects you're working on, but is there anything we've missed that people, I mean, you've got websites I'll put in the link and so on, but anything else that I should know about or viewers should know about? <laughs> Do you want to go first? Um, I mean, I don't really have much to say. I, I do not have a, a fancy website or anything, so it's just my uh, my Durham University page. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's the way to go. Yeah. But um, <laughs> uh, I was just just saying that like I'm always happy to to connect with people. You know, about uh, I am on Twitter. Um, but I don't really talk much academic stuff on on Twitter. <laughs> it's mostly parenthood. Um, but uh and working parenthood, I should say. But um, but I'm always happy to email, you know, to respond to emails about if people are interested in things and they want to talk. And uh, my email will be on my, my Durham page, so. Fantastic. Yeah, and uh, my University of Suffolk staff uh, profile page is probably the best place to go in the first instance um, if, if people are interested in, in chatting about any of the stuff we've talked about here or, or other things besides. Um, yeah, please get in touch also on Twitter. Um, <clears throat> And um, yeah, uh, open for for all sorts of conversation about weird and wonderful things in the Viking Age. Well, 
Thank you both. And the pair of articles we've been focused on, one's called Exploring Animals as Agents and Objects in Early Medieval Iceland and Scandinavia, and the other one, The Role of Horses in Viking Age Ritual Action, will be out soon. And uh, <laughs> we'll put links in the description whenever they're available. We can always update the description to, to include any new highlights. So get in touch when those out. But thank you again, both of you. It's been a real delight, and I've gained so many insights into this you know, fascinating field of interdisciplinary study and at some point we'll have to talk about the, the the blessings and curses of collaboration but I think you have you've I've had many good experiences but I think you're having a much better run of it than I've had <laughs> you know but maybe I'll get maybe I'll need to become less jaded again after so many ups and downs of collaboration but I do think it's so much fresh stuff does come out of collaboration and it's great to see the work that you're doing both of you so thank you so much for sharing it all with us thank you thank you Howard really appreciate yeah. the opportunity yes thank you very much if you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to Howard Williams on YouTube. In addition, consider following the Archeodeath WordPress blog at howardwilliamsblog.wordpress.com.